looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. All things being equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you All Things Legal on Styles FM, Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Hello, everyone. Welcome to All Things Legal. Just in case you did not join us last week, allow me to do an introduction of who I am again and what to expect of this program in its forthcoming weeks. My name is Janine Leng, and I have been an attorney at law for over 10 years. I love reading about the law and I enjoy the practice of the law and I thought that it would be useful to share with you about all things legal. Every week, I will be looking at one legal topic which affects the Jamaican legal landscape. I will also be reviewing some topical legal news items which appear in our weekly news. I will also be using topics which are suggested by you and I hope to answer any questions which you may have about specific scenarios. There will be no limit to the gamut of legal issues which we will explore on this program and where I am not seized of the information. I will invite resource persons to share with you further. Now, this program is not meant to substitute or replace legal advice from an attorney at law. And you should still consult your attorney at law if you have legal issues, even if the facts are similar to those discussed on the program. Again, I thank you for listening and I look forward to sharing with you in the coming weeks. I would also like to give a special shout out to my students at Titchfield High School, option one for English literature. Today being the day of love, just as we studied the constant image of your face this week, that poem, I just want to let you know, Lemoy, Kadori, Cardiff, Evron, and the rest of the class, that indeed you guys have become the accomplice of my heart. Now, let's look at a few news items which came in the news this week. Could you remind me of the numbers again, Cassidy? What's in the news? Dollars for dust. There was a Gleaner article published today, February 14, 2020. Now, in St. Elizabeth, close to the Alpart, site there is a mud lake and there were issues of a dust nuisance let me just pause to give you the numbers our local number is 876-453-1444 that is 876-453-1444 and our international number is 954 954- Three three eight seven nine seven three. You can call in or WhatsApp in your comments or your questions as the program progresses. Now, as I was saying, there is a dust nuisance issue concerning the Alpart Mud Lake in Saint Elizabeth, and over. Over the course of a number of days in December and January of this year, there were certain events which took place that affected the communities of Upper Warminster, Marysville, Al Valley, Lower Warminster, Upper Brinkley, Northampton, Lower Brinkley, Austin, Buena Vista Housing Scheme, and Genius. And these people experienced a dust nuisance, which means that there was a proliferation of dust emanating from the Alpart Mud Lake, and it affected the community. Now, what is a nuisance? A nuisance is any activity of your neighbor that can affect your ability to enjoy your property. So if your neighbor has some sewer that, you know, lets out water onto your property that can be interpreted as a nuisance. You know, there's also nuisance of of noise if your your neighbor... um, 
repeatedly um, plays their music too loud, that can be a nuisance, which can, which can be actionable at law. Now, these persons, they were so severely affected by the dust which was coming out of this Alpart mud lake that they negotiated a settlement with Alpart in the tune of $40 million. Now, this sounds like... This sounds like a lot of money. Does it sound like a lot of money, listeners? <laughs> well, guess how many residents were affected by this dust nuisance? Over 1,200. 1,200 residents. Now, if you divide 40 million by 1,200, that approximates to 33,000 for each resident. That's not an awful lot of money. $33,000. Each resident is expected to collect as a result of how they were affected by this dust nuisance. What do you think about this settlement? Do you consider it to be reasonable? Do you consider it to be fair? Do you think that it fully captures the inconvenience and the loss and the possible injuries that these people would have faced as a result of the dust from this Alpine mud lake. You know, having worked with an international company which is not dissimilar to Alpine, I can tell you that normally when a company of this stature pays out $40 million, they require everyone who collects out of this settlement to sign what is called a release and discharge agreement. And a release and discharge agreement means that these parties would not be allowed to make any further claim after they call it this $33,000. So I wonder, I really have to ask myself, could it be that some of these persons down in St. Elizabeth have some lingering health problems? Did they get properly examined by a medical doctor? Won't you think? Hmm? Would you have accepted a settlement of $33,000 if for weeks you have been suffering under this mud lake? And in the news report this week, the residents say that they have been suffering for years and that this $33,000 does not adequately compensate them. They also say that the, the, the activities are continuing and they're still experiencing you know, dust which is coming onto their property. You know, one resident was reported to have said that little compensation money can't go far. We are still hampered. We can't even get a good shower. I believe that um, even on the news, the, the television news had reported, you know, had shown video footage of how the dust had covered the homes of some of these people who, who were close to this mud lake. And, you know, um, the country is seeing quite an unprecedented level of development right across the island. You know, there is construction activity everywhere. You know, I was just passing through the junction. It don't matter how many times I wash my car. Once I pass through Broadgate, my car becomes brown. No matter how they shine it and rub it down, it becomes brown. And these construction activities are going to be continuing across our island. You know, um, the government just signed a contract with China Harbor to improve the roadway from Port Antonio to Morant Bay. And that might also create certain nuisance in the construction activities. What say you if you were to be affected by any you know, if they're doing any blasting, any construction activity which causes, you know, undue dust onto your property, how would you treat with it? Would you be willing to accept 33,000 Jamaican dollars as reasonable compensation for your inconvenience? What do you think, listeners? What do you have to say about that? Is this reasonable? Um, in the news report, the minister for economic um, growth and development, um, Mr. Daryl Vaz, he had indicated too that perhaps one of the reasons is that 
there has been a reduced amount of rainfall since last year. So this might have been one of the factors which would have contributed to the dust nuisances. He said that the last time that it rained in the St. Elizabeth was on December 10th, when it, when it temporarily halted the dust nuisance from the Mud Lake, which is located on 650 acres of land. But the residents are not convinced. One said, dust has been affecting us for almost 30 years now. And all the previous owners of the bauxite plant have treated us very bad. And now the Chinese owners are about to do the same, said a resident called Hanson. Now I see a, a listener here um, writing in, I think that offer to the residents in St. Elizabeth is a mere drop in the bucket. What if there is long-term health problems? How far will that $33,000 go? That is really a legitimate um, concern and a legitimate comment, um, listener. Indeed, that is a very, very... Um in view of the large picture, it might not properly compensate, especially children. You know, Cassidy, what do you think? If you have a child and probably child trouble with asthma, not true. Huh? The dust, to inhale the dust over several days might actually worsen an existing health condition. I don't know, 33,000 Jamaican dollars might not be enough. That, that, that might not be enough to cover. So I, I really wonder, we haven't really heard a lot about the terms of this settlement agreement, but all the article said it, it was that it was $40 million and that had to be divided among 1,200 people. So we will continue to look on this story and see if there is any further development in the news. I, I see another um, comment coming in on the topic of nuisance. Port Antonio has a serious noise pollution problem. What can the authorities do about it? You know, indeed, we do have a noise abatement act. And just sometimes it, 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 it is not enforced. So, um, you know, um, quite a lot of our legislations in this country lack enforcement. So perhaps that is something that we need to, to lobby our local um, officials to see if they can assist in. And it's true, Port Antonio is a noisy little town. <laughs> we really need to do something more about that. I understand that our way of announcing various events is through the town criers, but um, sometimes it can be very, very noisy with the music playing all the time. Now, there is another matter which appeared in the news um, on Sunday, the Sunday Gleano. There was an article entitled, A Matter of Land, Time-Sensitive Land Surveying Documents. For our listeners who are purchasing land, right, or they're dealing in land transactions, maybe you're trying to apply for your registered title for the first time, this might be for you. Now, there are some survey documents which are time-sensitive, the article said. Now, what survey documents are time-sensitive? If you're going to be purchasing a, a piece of land or a property and you want to get a mortgage from NHT or any other financial institution, they will require you to get what is called a surveyor's identification report. Now, this surveyor's identification report will include details of the boundaries of the land, if there is any encroachments on the property, if any building is on the property, and things of that nature. Now, this surveyor's ID report, it carries a lifetime of one year. It expires after one year. So if you have a surveyor's ID report and you want to get a mortgage from NHT and it, the time period exceeds one year, then you will have to renew the surveyor's ID report before it can be accepted by that various um, you know, um, financial institution. So lending agencies will require a surveyor's ID report which is less than a year old. Another survey document which carries an expiry date are your pre-check plans or your survey diagrams. 
A lot of persons sometimes even mistake their pre-check plans or their survey diagrams for title. You know, a lot of people will come to me and they'll say, you know, Miss Leng, I have a title. I have a title, man. You know, I have a title for how many years? And they bring this pre-check plan and this survey diagram. And I say, no, this is not a title. This is a survey diagram. And the survey diagram, sometimes it's on... Um, a soft normal printing paper but a lot of times especially for the pre-check plan it's on this kind of um, um plastic paper it's a little plastic and um it, it you know it can be bent it's not so easily torn so the pre-check plan is normally used when you're going to be applying for your title for the first time so say for instance your grandmother used to own the land she died and you decide that you know you want to regularize things your grandmother thought it was just enough for you to be paying taxes you know but you want to regularize you want to get your your title your official title in hand then one of the documents that you're going to need is the pre-check plan or a survey diagram. Now, this, the pre-check plan has an expiry date of seven years, right? Seven years. So the validity is for seven years. The surveyor's ID report is for one year. But the pre-check diagram, it lasts for seven years. So you have a, sh a longer window within which to use your pre-checked um, diagram. And I would suggest to you, um, listeners, that if you're going to be applying for surveyors' reports, surveyors' ID reports or pre-checked diagrams, that you make sure that you have everything in place um, to support these documents because, you know, um, sometimes the surveyors' um, fees can be quite expensive and you don't want to be duplicating expenses if you don't need to. Do you understand? Um, so the surveyors' diagram, it lasts for seven years. But there is a solution to this seven-year problem for the pre-checked um, diagram, as the article indicated, because we're still talking about what's in the news. And this article was written by a a surveyor in this country his name is craig david and he said that one of the ways that you can remedy this problem you can contact your land surveyor and have him resurvey the property and prepare a new plan and of course you'd have to pay for the cost of that new plan he will then submit that new plan to the survey and mapping division of the national land agency or what we typically as jamaicans call the titles office for pre-checking and approval and when this is done, you will have a new plan that has a useful life of seven more years. Another alternative is that you can have a land surveyor's declaration. So the same surveyor who prepared the pre-checked diagram, right? You let him prepare what is called a declaration and he would sign it before a JP to say, I'm the one who prepared this surveyor's um, diagram. And um, he can say that the... The boundaries which are underground are still the same. So that would continue. That would give a, 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 a refresher to the, surveyor's, um, the survey diagram um, and would give it an extension um, of time. So if you're going to be applying for title, if you're going to be purchasing property, I suggest to you that you look at your survey documents because they are time sensitive. There are quite a number of persons who have come to me and they have documents sometimes which are 20 years old. Is them grandmother prepare survey as report and survey diagram? You know, but you know, and part of the reason why the law places a, a, a limitation period on, 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 um, on these documents. Think about it, listeners. A lot of things can change in one year, you know. When you did that surveyor's ID report, the next year your neighbor can thief off a piece of your land, build a wall, take off a, co um, a couple inches off your land. Then there's also the issue of erosion with rainfall. The boundaries of your land can change too, you know. It might not be significant, but the title's office, they, they, they embark on a very forensic exercise as scientific as they can be. So they want to make sure that they are accurate, right, in issuing title to, to title applicants. So they want to make sure that your surveyor's reports and your surveyor diagrams are accurate. 
So please look at the dates. Please look at the dates on your surveyors diagrams. What do you think, listeners? Do you, any of you have currently any survey diagrams at home or any surveyors ID reports that you have any questions um, concerning those documents? What do you think about that article? I thought it was a very useful article. And I think that it applied. It, um, it has implications for a number of Jamaicans, especially at a time when the title's office is pushing a drive, you know, in association with LAMP to ensure that as many Jamaicans as possible possess their registered title. You know, in, um, especially in, in the rural areas, quite a lot of properties are unregistered. People don't have their registered title. And it is very, very important for you to have your registered title. That is, that is the strongest um, form of ownership where land is concerned. And the law you know, estimates it so highly and so greatly that the only thing that can defeat your registered title is fraud. And fraud is a very, very, very difficult burden to discharge. So it is good to have your registered title. And if, if you don't have your registered title, I would suggest that you start taking steps to apply for one. You know, I just wanted to share that, you know, that the title of the, the Gleaner article for the residents in, in, in St. Elizabeth was Dollars for Dust. If my students are listening to me, I want you to tell me what literary device is used there. Dollars for dust. What literary device is used? 10 option, English literature option one at Titchfield High School. Lamoy Spencer, Cardiff Mackenzie. What literary device used there? What about you, Kadori? Are you listening? Or Abigail? Or Najee? All of my students in grade 10. I'm doing a little volunteering. Um, I see another comment coming in from Alex Temp Tampo. Yes, indeed, Alex. I do practice real estate law as well. So, you know, both of these news items which came in our news this week were very, very useful. And um, I thought were very instructive, you know. Um, so if you feel that you have been affected by a nuisance, then you can kickstart the process by negotiating with the person who has affected you by their nuisance or institute legal proceedings. In the case of Alpart, they were able to negotiate a settlement of no mean order of $40 million and um, with 33000 allotted to each resident of the respective communities that we had named before. Now, I want to get into the meat of the matter. Another news item which also has legal implication that I want to look at this evening um, concerns the deportation flight of certain... I don't even know if I can call them Jamaicans because they don't consider themselves Jamaicans, Cassidy. Because some of these persons, they have lived in the United States for... They have lived in the United States for since they their children some of them since they're toddlers you know and um because of these various infractions they were deported this week now so this is what we're going to be looking at in the main this evening we're going to be examining certain legal implications of this deportation um exercise from the UK, we're going to look at whether or not our law sufficiently addresses the, the, the standing of deportees in this country. You know, how are they reincorporated in the Jamaican society? How are they rehabilitated? What programs, what social programs are available for, you know, um, deportees? And how, how should Jamaicans view persons who are returning from the United Kingdom or the United States, as the case may be, um, under these circumstances. What do you think, listeners? I, wanted, I want you to, uh, I want to jog your, your brains this evening. I want you to tell me what your thoughts are concerning that charter flight coming out of the United Kingdom with 17 Jamaicans 
right? Um, guilty of certain offenses, many of them being drug offenses. Um, what do you think about them being deported back to Jamaica and being forced to start over? What do you think about those things? Are you concerned about it? Do you think that our Jamaican laws should should um, reflect or should have some consideration for how they are reintroduced in our Jamaican society? No. What had happened was that when the deport... Okay, before we go into the meat of the program, I see how I see a question here coming in from Yvonne. How long is a survey ID report valid? A survey ID report is valid for one year. And after the year, it expires and you would need to get a new surveyor's ID report. Okay, Yvonne, so it's valid only for one year. One year. And the pre-check diagram or that 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 um that diagram of the property that shows the boundaries and it's on this kind of plastic paper pardon me that one is valid for seven years okay so we're going to take a break now and when we come back we will resume our discussion on the deportation issue of course we still welcome your questions or your comments on the other items which appeared in the news Thank you. Join your host, Janine Lang, on Styles FM this and every Friday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for all things legal. We'll be looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. All things being equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you all things legal on Styles FM, Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. This is showing with the voice of John T. Your reggae ambassador. And we're talking about this big one. Yes, my show. It's all about Portland Black History Reggae Month. And it's all the Reggae Showcase 2020. Taking place at Liverland Tony Park, Portland Tony Portland. Saturday, February 22nd, 2020. Gates open at 10 a.m. Featuring the living legend himself, Mr. Dan Roy Morgan. The Jolly Boys will be there. Warrior King. St. Thomas coming a collective and other acts will be there. Admission $300 before 4 p.m. $500 after 4. Donations will be accepted. Also a live outside broadcast of the John T. Show from 1 to 5 p.m. on a Saturday. This event is sponsored by Born to Win Entertainment, RiggyRoundTheWorld.com, Chati Entertainment, Columbina, Moving Taste Forward, DIB Hardware, Robinson Sons Hardware, Eastern Car Rental, Car Come Out Parts, Axe Studio, Portland Credit Union, Portland Jewelers, Portland Municipal Corporation, and Tennis Stars. Remember, Reggae Showcase 2020, Saturday, February 22nd. I want to see your face on the place. White Case Pharmacy, West Street, Portland, Twinio, would like to thank all our valid customers and friends. As we celebrate our 25th anniversary on Friday, February 14, Valentine's Day. No fee on prescription all day. And guess what? Discounts on all prescriptions and on all items in the store. There will be giveaways of gift baskets, health checks such as blood pressure, sugar tests, cholesterol tests, sickle cell trait tests, and so much more. White Caves Pharmacy, making life better for you. Friday, February 14, Valentine's Day. Our 25th anniversary. Come celebrate with us. White Case Pharmacy, West Street, Port Antonio. Zane's Pharmacy is now open at shop number 8, Presa Plaza, Morant Bay. We're here to satisfy all your pharmaceutical needs and more. Currently, we do free blood pressure checks and blood sugar testing, as well as HIV testing and counseling. Zane's Pharmacy, open Mondays to Saturdays, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And on Sundays, for your convenience, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Telephone 876-779-0006 or WhatsApp your prescriptions to 876-855-6291. That's Zane's Pharmacy, now open at shop number 8, Presa Plaza, Morant Bay. Hello? Talk fast, you have one minute, because on a Friday night, me have a tune in to Real Talk on Styles 96 FM. Me and you have questions about love, birds, and the bees. Not to mention the ticks and the fleas. So you try tuning in on a Friday night between 9 and 12 for Real Talk at a show we discuss everything real and nothing ideal. Join your host, Janine Lang, on Styles FM this 
and every Friday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for all things legal. We'll be looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. All things being equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you all things legal on Styles FM. Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. And we are back. I saw a BBC news report on the 10th of this month, this week, in fact. Now, what happened was that there was a deportation order made for certain Jamaican detainees who were in detention in the United Kingdom. After serving their sentences, there was a deportation order made against them. Now, after the deportation order was made, they made an emergency application to the Court of Appeal in the United Kingdom protesting the deportation order. Now, the Court of Appeal judge ordered that the Home Office of the United Kingdom was not to deport those persons to Jamaica on Tuesday. You know that the people came to Jamaica on Tuesday. Remember the flight? There was a, 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 a big display. The gleaner came and videoed them, and we saw some of them covering their faces, you know, at Herman Barracks. But the judge decided that only those persons, right, who had access to a functioning non zero two SIM card on or before the 3rd of February could be deported. And what that was saying was that the persons who did not have the SIM card, they could not be deported because they did not have an opportunity to call their lawyers to seek legal advice on the deportation. Right? So... This is because some lawyers in the United Kingdom had argued that some of the persons that who were said to be deported from two detention centers were not able to get legal advice due to issues with an O2 mast. Now, the Home Office of the United Kingdom, they were not happy that um, several persons were not now able to be on the flight coming out of the United Kingdom um, with the deportees on Tuesday. Um, the the labor is Diane Abbott said that removing the detainees was, was unfair. The Home Secretary, though, Mr. Patel, said that many were guilty of serious offenses. Miss Patel, in fact, and not Mr., pardon me, said every person on the flight had received a custodial sentence of 12 months or more. Therefore, under legislation introduced by the Labour government in 2007, she said, a deportation order must be made. So once you are in the United Kingdom, you commit an offence, you received a custodial sentence of 12 months or more, you are liable to be deported. As my grandmother would have said, you depend on people eyelash. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's very sad. The Home Office said that the planned charter flight to Jamaica is specifically for deporting foreign national offenders. They said that those detained for removal include people convicted, listen carefully, of manslaughter, rape, violent crime, and dealing Class A drugs. Now, what I want you to bear in mind, though, is that these persons served their sentences, right? So they owe the UK nothing as far as that is concerned. They served their sentences, and they are not guilty of any offenses in Jamaica. Their crimes were not committed in Jamaica. Now, the flight to Kingston, it was to leave on the 11th of February, and that flight included a man who arrived in the United Kingdom at the age of five, right? And because of that, Miss Abbott, who is a shadow home secretary, when she was speaking in the Commons, she said many of the proposed deportees came here as children and have no memory of Jamaica. One such deportee is a man who had been due to deported on Tuesday. His name is Howard Ormsby. 
He's a father of five. He was jailed for 18 months after he was convicted of possession with intent to supply Class A drugs and he was released in December. He said, I came here at the age of 15 with my older sister and I've been here 18 years of my life. He's now 32. Speaking to the BBC's Victoria Derbyshire show from a detention centre in West London, he said, I've never tried to deny the fact that I've made a mistake, but everyone has a chance to right their wrongs. And here's the crux of the matter. Mr. Ormsby said, I have all my family here. I have no one in Jamaica. But the UK Home Office was insistent that these persons were to be deported because they needed to protect the British public from serious, violent, and persistent foreign national offenders. What do you think about this, listeners? How do you feel about these persons being returned to our shores under these circumstances? How does it make you feel? Are you afraid? Are you alarmed in light of our own local criminal situation? which seems to be spiraling out of control in this country. Do you feel that these deportees can contribute to a rise in our crime level in Jamaica? What do you think? I'm going to read certain comments which came in. It says, one, one reader said, No shame in the game. We're all Jamaican. Just hopefully they get the chance to better their life. Another reader said, this will help the crime situation greatly. So this listener thinks that this is going to cause an increase in our crime rate. And then somebody said, hope Jamaica has rehabilitation programs for these people. Another person says, well, they did the crimes. The times, no time to be at the homeland of their birth. Now, are there any legal restrictions in our law, in the laws of Jamaica, concerning deported persons? Indeed, there are none. There are no official express legal restrictions on the rights of deported persons in Jamaica. There are no legal obligations placed on deported persons to disclose to the general public their status as a deportee or their criminal convictions abroad. Deported persons are free to seek employment and education at all levels and are also able to vote and participate freely in the national and local government. But the problem that the deportees voice so readily and often are the unofficial restrictions on their lives that disrupt their lives. The unofficial policy of the social stigma. When you refer to a person as a deportee, you know, it's such a label which is so painful. It prevents them from, you know, um, moving on from their mistakes. You know, um, so how does Jamaica as a nation deal with this unofficial policy of ostracizing deported persons? I'm seeing a listener here writing in. When you're in a foreign country, even if you're a citizen, you must abide by the country's rule. So double punish is harsh, but it's the law. Well, I mean, you are indeed um, correct, um, you know, um, because in, indeed, you know, these persons have served their time. They have served their time um, in the United Kingdom, so... You know, um, they have served the term of their sentences there. And part of the law there is since 2007 is that they have to be deported back to Jamaica, to their home country, their country of birth. So, you know, that's the position of the UK government. So I, I see your point there, listener. 
what we need to consider is another listener writing in what we need to consider is can these individuals be gainfully employed or rehabilitated because if not they may just turn to crime as a means of survival thank you for that um statement um listener because that is really a legitimate point you know um some of the persons who turned up um on that flight on the 11th on, on tuesday this week they had no family there was no waiting family to greet them because they have absolutely no family in jamaica to meet them Right, and the government has no official policy of rehabilitation. It's mostly a lot of NGOs or non governmental organizations who meet these people at the airport or at Herman, um, Herman um, Barracks where they are housed after they are deported, and they might offer certain social services in terms of you know allowing them to um, to access certain social programs drop-in centers where they can take a shower because some of these persons have no family here. You know, they, they don't have any families that they can go to the country and say they can live with family. They have absolutely nobody at all in Jamaica, you know. So, um, so there are really no official rehabilitation programs. Um, most of them come from non, non-governmental organizations. But the truth of the matter is that there have been some studies which have been done by certain non-governmental um, organizations, including the National Organization of Deported Migrants. And they actually found that only about 4% of deportees return to a life of crime. So that suggests that even if there is, they do commit crime, it is negligible in terms of increasing the crime rate of Jamaica. So maybe we don't need to be so fearful of... Um, of the deportees, you know, today is Valentine's Day, and I'm not really into this pagan celebration because every day should be a day of love, right? But maybe we should show a little bit more love to the deportees so that they can feel a little bit more welcome coming back to sweet, sweet Jamaica. We can make them, let me tell you, you know, a couple of friends and I, from time to time, we go downtown Kingston and we feed the homeless before the Supreme Court where that um, post office is on King Street. And let me tell you, listeners, homelessness does not have a face. You might be very surprised at some of the people that you see who are homeless, who are so quick to come and collect a box of food. They look just like me and you. You could go in the bank right now and see a person. You could go um, any public place to access any facility and you see a person. They look clean. They look well-dressed. Because they go to these various drop-in centers, you know, the Good Samaritan Inn in, in Kingston. Other drop-in centers that caters to, to homeless people where they can go in for the day, take a shower, get a meal, and they go back on, on the street, you know. So um, it, it's tough. It's tough and it, it really only takes just one unfortunate incident for sometimes for our circumstances to change listeners. And I know it's hard to think that some of these people are rapists that might be guilty of manslaughter. But if they have served their time, I think maybe we should give them a second chance. Let me hear what Karen has to say. Karen, Karen is saying, let me see what she's saying there, Cassidy. Karen says, it's going to be worse in Jamaica with them. Maybe you can tell where they are going to live. Yes, um, it can be very, very difficult for them to come back into a country where, um, I mean, Jamaica is hard for us, not true. Jamaica hard for we, much less for them coming from a first world country to come here to start all over, not true, Cassidy. All right, so of course, it, it might be worse. It, um, as another listener said, it might force them to turn to a life of, of crime, but you know, we believe in community involvement and if the community starting at the top with the government instituting you know policy and certain programs that we can we, we can actually assist you know our jamaican um brothers and sisters if there are any i think it was only men though who were deported um 
you know, to, 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 to reacclimatize themselves back to the Jamaican society because no in a sweet like yard. Let's see what um, Desreen has to say. Desreen is writing from, oh, Desreen says, so true. Yes, Desreen, you know, everybody can make mistakes. So I think that we probably should be a little bit um, more sympathetic to, um, to some of these um, deportees. No, just a, a, some little bit more um, legal tidbits concerning the deportees. Now, when, when you are deported, what happens is that you are required to hand over your passports to the immigration authorities in the deporting countries to confirm your nationality, right? Now, the passports of these deported persons, they are sent through the Jamaican mission, either the embassy, the high commission, or the consulate, and um, then they are sent to the passport immigration or citizenship agency, that's PICA, right? Where you go to apply for your passport or citizenship, um, as the case may be. So PICA, once the, the deportees land in Jamaica, they are possessed of the deportees' passports, right? So they are the ones who process the passports of the deportees. Once you are deported, you can go back to the passport office, Right? For them to release your passport to you if you are a deportee who is listening and there's no condemnation from Styles FM for any deportee. Um, we want you to be rehabilitated. We want you to get a new lease on life. And um, we welcome you just the same back to our country. Um, no, so, so if it is that you wait too long though to retrieve your passport and, and it expires, then you have to um then you have to you have to um apply to renew your passport. I see another listener saying the government should now begin to put measures in place to rehabilitate them because realistically we can't refuse them. They are Jamaicans. That is true. I agree with that listener. Another listener says Good evening, Miss. I'm deeply sorrowful for them. How will they manage? Yes, part of part of um, the assistance that we can um, we can actually render is to, is to remove that stigma that we have against deportees. You know, maybe we should stop calling them deportees. They're just Jamaicans. Maybe I should stop using that word. What do you think? Would you? A would you come with deportee? What, what was the name of that song again? Cassidy, I don't remember. Something about, uh, about even, um, what's his name? Sean Paul sing a song about deportee too. I don't know. But uh, may, what, what, Cassidy, tell me a name that I can call them instead. Long lost Jamaicans, I don't know. <laughs> I see another listener said, how are we taking them and we can't send back foreigners from, what's that? From, from minister? Oh, what does that mean? We can't send back. I, I'm not. Uh, are we sending? We can't send back foreigners. You know, actually, Jamaica has a deportation act. You know, yes. So we can actually deport. Um, we can actually deport persons, Commonwealth citizens. We can do so. Um, you know, returning residents. Oh, <laughs> I like that list. No, we can call them returning residents, of course. So that's what we're going to be calling them. Or returning residents, we want to treat them with a lot more acceptance and love so that they, they don't feel like criminals. Because, you know, even the Bible says, you know, evil. The, so a man think it in his heart, so is he. So you tell the man that he's a criminal. The man start believes him a criminal. And then after a while, he start act like a criminal, don't it? So we really need to stop calling them um, deportees. And I, I like that term, returning residents. Because returning residents really has a, you know, it's a posh sound to it. Sounds tush, not true. <laughs> right? But just for completeness, you know, um... The National Intelligence Bureau, which we, 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 we know as Kingfish, um, they're the ones who normally used to keep on file the criminal history sheets of persons who are returned to Jamaica under these circumstances because of a crime committed while abroad. You know, um, but what I want you to bear in mind is that even though these persons possess a criminal history abroad, they are not considered to be criminals here. Because they have not been co convicted of any criminal, criminal activity on the shores of Jamaica. So they are not considered to be a criminal in Jamaica. Right? Um, 
and they said that these criminal history sheets are kept on file as a precautionary measure. You know, um, these returned residents <laughs> uh, whose criminal history sheets, history sheets have been forwarded to the National Intelligence Bureau at the time. I think it might be another division of the police force um, who interviews these persons within the, sec the first or second day of their arrival. And they are not required to do any further reporting. So once they come, they interview them, kind of get um, a feel as to, you know, who they are and what they're about. And then they're released. But they do keep a record of their criminal history that was committed, whether, whether it's in the United Kingdom or the United States. Because we do have people who are deported from the U.S. from time to time. We've all heard about ICE. ICE is a lot in the news, right, in concerning the United States. Another listen says, listener says, um, why most people believe that all of them are uneducated? That is true, too. Not all of them are uneducated. Some persons are actually educated. Some of these persons who have actually found themselves on the wrong side of the law. And um, I tell you something, you know, one of my experiences in... in, in in assisting some of the homeless persons in Kingston, you know, to treat a human being with dignity. You know, it, you know, it, it's something that is that's so critical that we, we learn to to master as Jamaicans. As Jamaicans, sometimes we like to hit, hit a man more when he's down. It don't make any sense. A man on the ground already. What are you going to hit him further down for? You know, I, I am sure that they're embarrassed that they found themselves in that situation and that they already, it must be painful. Can you imagine the turmoil that a person must be experiencing on that flight? Can you imagine? I can't, I can't imagine how afraid, not knowing what is going to face them on their arrival to Jamaica. You know, it's, it's, it's really tough. You know, um, it's really, really tough. So I, I believe, though, that to prevent these persons, you know, one of the problems with Jamaica is that um, as far as criminality is concerned is that a lot of times our laws and our policies, they, they are geared towards criminals at the, after the crime has been committed. But we need more preventative measures you know, I mean, I do see over the years our government has made efforts, for sure, to have um, youth programs in various um, depressed communities. But they need to be more. Um, they need to be all across the island. And we need to increase the numbers of these programs because so many people are struggling. They have so many issues, you know. Um, so we, we really need to make them feel needed. And perhaps even the way that um, we have treated them by making a big public spectacle of them when they arrive in the island is really not necessary. You know, one, one NGO, part of their, their function um, as a non-governmental organization, they greet um, uh, returning migrants arriving from Britain, Canada, and the United States at the island's two international airports and help them to clear their personal effects through customs. You know, I saw a Glena article this this week where this lady, she actually goes to um, Herman Barracks in Kingston, where which houses the, 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 these um, residents um, while they, they are processed to be released. And she sells them phone cards because some of them come down with nothing at all but a shirt on them back. Can you imagine? Just to have a phone card for call somebody. And she sells them phone cards and stuff. And I think she says that she's a nail tech. But she, I think that just the way that they, they go into the, um, the, the, the detention center, it's just the same way that they're sent. You wouldn't really have a lot of things in, 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 in prison. You know, because remember, they're actually housed at a detention center. It's not like they're taken from home and placed on a flight. Well, their family would be responsible for those things. You know, their family would have to get lawyers and probably powers of attorney and, you know, things of that nature to deal with whatever assets that they might leave in the United Kingdom. You know, um, so, you know, another thing that this NGO does is to transport newly arrived residents to relatives 
able to take them in or to a temporary shelter when family is av unavailable. You know, even um, this week in the news, um, I believe it was Desmond McKenzie who had instituted a shelter in Hanover, you know, where um, some homeless persons can come and learn particular skills, you know, sewing and um, some of them, even this NGO teaches um, these um, returning residents, you know, farming so that they can actually have a livelihood of their own and that they don't become a strain on the society. Another um, thing that this NGO does is that they, they assist the new returnees with, this is another term that we could use, returnees, right? Finding more permanent lodging and acquiring essential government identification documents such as birth certificates and tax registration numbers because, trust me, listeners, you can't do nothing in Jamaica if you don't have a TRN. So the returnees have to get TRN, right? And if they want to vote, they know how to get voters ID, birth certificates, and things of that nature, right? And then, of course... These NGOs also give them advice um, concerning resources for earning livelihoods. You know, so what are some of the issues that you have um, you have identified? Okay, thank you. Thank you for listening, Althea from Long Road. Thank you. I really appreciate your feedback. Um, what are some of the issues arising from this deportation that we need to have more institutional programs? to take care of our Jamaican people. We're all Jamaicans. Let's get together and feel all right. Not you, Cassidy, right? So um, what the government does, though, need to have a more structured program in place. You know, in preparing for this program, I was calling various agencies, and most of them were very tight-lipped about giving information about it, and they really don't have a lot of programs in place to assist these returnees on making their transition to Jamaica. But if indeed you are returning and you're listening to this program, I just want you to know that all is not lost. There is still hope. And um, you can make it in Jamaica. You just need to find the right persons. And some persons might speak badly about you, but they speak badly of us down here too. Whether we are returnees or not. Right. Um, but I, I still believe that Jamaica is a place of love and um, we do have a lot of love and I do wish you all the best. I really thank you all for tuning in this evening. It was really an interesting um, discourse with you. I really enjoyed um, sharing with you and I really enjoyed you providing feedback. Thank you for joining me and um, all things being legal, all things being equal. Join me next week for All Things Legal. Join your host, Janine Lang, on Styles FM this and every Friday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for All Things Legal. We'll be looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. All Things Being Equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you All Things Legal on Styles FM, Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. This is Styles FM. Workers in the tourism industry are one step closer to having an official pension scheme. Preliminary registrations have begun across the industry for the pension plan set to impact over 300,000 workers. Stick around for an update on this week's Tourism Roundup. Employees in the tourism industry up until recently had to work well beyond the age of retirement in order to take care of themselves and their family. The primary reason for this was the absence of retirement benefits for tourism workers. Fast forward to 2019 when the government passed legislation to secure a pension scheme for tourism workers. Now in 2020, the Minister of Tourism has begun preliminary registration for the fund. Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett says the administrative team is being assembled to manage the registration process. Minister Bartlett adds that the ministry is working with the HR departments of businesses in the industry to create a framework to facilitate the registration process. But we recognize that the timelines between when all of this is being 
are structured and when in fact the effective date comes into being, a number of people become 60. And so we think it is equity that we should try to embrace them. And, and that's how the augmented arrangement is. So that allows now for within 180 days after we've designated that um, those people have the opportunity to register. The Tourism Workers' Pension Fund is open to workers 18 to 59 years old and arrangements are being made to register self-employed persons. Special arrangements are being made to facilitate persons who turned 60 before the Tourism Act was gazetted. The purpose of enabling these augmented beneficiaries to participate is to respond to Jamaica's world leading arrangement because no other country has done this where a government puts billion dollars in the fund to enable the commencement of the fund so that those who would not have had the requisite years of contribution to be able to get a benefit if you're far beyond the age to join the fund not to worry as the ministry is drafting a solution for that category of workers we have been thinking about them and we have to look at what kind of arrangement we can make in relation to the volume i mean the number of them because we have been able to identify fully yet in those because when the surveys were done they were, they were done in relation to people who are beyond or who are going to be beyond 60. so we now have to find out what that looks like in the industry and in terms of whether somebody's crash your payment or something of that sort in the year to, to, to just help them. It will have to be a one-time payment. Minister Bartlett outlines how much tourism workers will be required to contribute to the fund. Well, it's a 3% initially, 3% of whatever you get for the first three years and then 5% after that. But remember now that the 3% is matched by 3% from the employer and the 5% is match. But if you are able to put more, you can contribute up to 20% of your salary over time. So it will be up to 15 for you and 5 for the employer. So it's Tourism Minister Edmund Barlett. If you're interested in joining the Tourism Workers' Pension Fund, speak to your HR department today. In our No Jamaica segment, the Kingston Harbour, the seventh largest harbour in the world, Kingston Harbour consists of an almost landlocked area of water, roughly 10 miles long and 2 miles wide. Much of this water, even close to the shore, is deep enough to accommodate large ships. That's it for this week's Tourism Roundup. I'm Andre Palmer with student engineer Tora Samuels. One love. Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with the cold or flu-like symptoms. If you become ill, please visit your doctor or the nearest health center and share your travel history. The flu and coronavirus can kill. Let's protect each other. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness.